Welcome, good morning and good afternoon and good evening. We are thrilled to have about 500 people registered for today's event. The audio is available in French and English. Please use the interpretation button to select your language. I'm going to go over a few logistics now and then we'll turn it over to Emanuela who will introduce the series of webinars on the conceptual framework for addressing acute malnutrition in Africa's drylands. Then she will pass it to our moderator, Chris Jost. Christine will then lead the panel discussion. We will have at least 30 minutes for Q&A at the end. This webinar is scheduled for one and a half hours and we will end on time. In case you are new to the Zoom platform, let me take a moment to orient you. On the bottom of the screen, you will see the tools you need. Please use the chat icon at the bottom of your screen if you are having issues with the platform. Please use Q&A to submit questions for the panelists or moderator. You can submit your questions at any time and we'll get to as many as we can. You can submit your question in English or French. Please bear in mind that audio quality may deteriorate unexpectedly and become insufficient for interpretation. Our interpreters will indicate this verbally and resume interpretation as soon as the sound quality permits. We hope that the end of the session won't be the end of the discussion with and among you. We have a few ways that you can continue to engage that I'll go over after we hear from the panelists. Now I'm going to turn it over to Emanuela to tell us more about the adapted framework and this technical series. Thank you, Greg. So this is the uh, third webinar of the technical series on uh, a revised framework that is bringing a new focus on the importance of environment and seasonality, institutions and livelihood systems as the basic, more systemic drivers of acute malnutrition in Africa's drylands. The first session on, on the environment and seasonality stressed the importance of climatic variability in the drylands and the need to understand the relationship between environment and seasonality and acute malnutrition in the drylands. However, this relation is mediated by institutions and systems which shape the livelihood and ultimately acute malnutrition in Africa's drylands. This was well illustrated in our last panel. These sessions and discussions on the drivers of acute malnutrition stem from the increasing recognition and acknowledgement among nutritionists and other professionals of the problem of persistent acute malnutrition which is proven to occur in both emergency and as well as in um, emergency context, as well as non-emergency. An earlier study in 2018, which was in our next slide, found that emergency rates of acute malnutrition occur persistently across the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. From this map on the right that you can see, the areas were persi of persistent uh, ma acute malnutrition were recognized, uh, were often in the dryland regions, stretching across the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. In the next slide, we are looking at the origin of the malnutrition causality framework. So, So the malnutrition causality framework has served as well as we've, we've really seen, describing both the immediate and the underlying drivers of acute malnutrition, which is subsequently have uh, universally been adopted since the 90s. However, this focus on the immediate and underlying causes contrasts with the lack of attention to the basic, more systemic drivers of acute malnutrition. The fact that these drivers are often overlooked or misunderstood may partly account for the persistently high rates of malnutrition we see today, despite ongoing emergency interventions or development programs. If we, we are to develop more effective uh, approaches for reducing acute malnutrition, it is critical that we develop our understanding of the basic drivers and how they work. In the next slide, we are actually basically saying that the revised framework conceptualizes these basic drivers as three interlinked areas. First of all, the environment and seasonality, system and institutions, and lastly, livelihood system. So today we are focusing on the dryland livelihood systems, 
We are looking at vulnerability, resilience, and shocks. In the last two weeks, we discussed environment and seasonality. And then we looked at institution, institution systems. If you missed any of these two webinars, you can find the recordings on the website. Next week, we will have the final panel. We hope you will join us, during which we will consider the next steps. How drivers of persistent malnutrition shape the response. UN representatives from FAO, from WFP, from WHO, and UNICEF will present the Global Action Plan on Child Wasting and stress the agency for developing improved approaches for addressing persistent acute malnutrition in Africa's dialands. Approaches that are, sh are shaped by an understanding of the basic, more systemic drivers of acute malnutrition. Through this technical series, we will share recent research that uh, that challenge some of our conventional wisdom and raise issues regarding strategies, approaches, and methods. After these four events, we will again revise the conceptual framework for understanding acute malnutrition in Africa's dialands based on the series discussions and your inputs. Next, we'll convene a high-level roundtable as part of which the UN agencies will seek firm policy commitments to support a systemic approach to addressing the basic drivers of acute malnutrition in Africa's islands. And now I'm pleased to turn it over to Dr. Kristen Jost, uh, the Senior Livestock Technical Advisor with USAID Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. Over to you, Chris. Chris will introduce the panel and um, the topics and lead the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. And good morning and good afternoon to all of our participants. In Africa's drylands, livelihoods have evolved to be well adapted to their highly variable environments. These environments are characterized by extreme rainfall variability, seasonality, and ecological diversity. Resilience to shocks is based on the fine-tuned integration of livelihoods with their environments. Over the past five decades, shocks and externalities have transformed traditional livelihood systems in Africa's drylands. While some changes have been positive, some, such as protracted conflict, land use change, and climate, have undermined the adaptability on which dryland livelihoods depend. Addressing malnutrition in Africa's drylands must start with local level understanding of the livelihood systems involved and the influence that these externalities and shocks have had on their adaptability and resilience. Today, I'm joined by Mariam Dem, Interim International Program Director at WaterAid, Bumbi Mwangi, Associate Professor with the Paul G. Allen School for Global Animal Health at Washington State University and the Director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Animal Health, Mokhtar Sakande, Projects Coordinator with Action Against Diversification desertification in the forestry division of the FAO, and Helen Young, professor and research director of the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, Feinstein International Center at Tufts University. All of these folks bring long and varied experience on livelihoods, vulnerability, and resilience. And we know many of you online also bring extensive experience. So I encourage you to participate through the question and answer and in the other ways on the series website that Greg will describe at the end. Miriam, you're up first, so over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, and hello everyone. Uh, Good afternoon, uh, good morning, and also maybe good evening if there is anyone joining uh, from, from Australia. So um, I'm really glad to join, to be part of this uh, conversation. And I would like to start by really thanking uh, the, the, the team that has organized this, the panel, the te technical series, 
and um, the folks at uh, World Food Program and through university for the opportunity they are giving water aid and myself really to to be back, part of this, uh, this these discussions on the uh, acute malnutrition and the dry land. And um, I also want to use the opportunity to really uh, congratulate World Food Program leadership and all of the staff for really winning uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, no, uh, uh, Nobel uh, Peace uh, Prize, which is really absolutely deserved. So um, now, uh, to really to, to um, start really sharing some of the, uh, some of the uh, point I would like to put forward uh, from, from where I sit, uh, it's really coming with the, um, uh, through the angle of the water sanitation and hygiene. Because as you know, um, uh, Water Aid, we are an international organization working across the globe uh, in, in uh, about 32 countries, both in the global north and global south, which focuses on really the, the access to water sanitation hygiene, uh, connecting with the other, uh, other aspects of development. So uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to, uh, as, as Chris and uh, Emmanuel also mentioned, the, the previous panel have already spoken about really the climate variability, you know, how it relates to, you know, and the links with the seasonality, et cetera. And we had also a summary at the introduction. So uh, it's really, as I said, focusing on the water sanitation hygiene in relation to the dry land livelihood systems, the, the resilience of, the, of its men and women, and also uh, the link with the gender and nutrition. Uh, so next, next slide, please. So what's the issue? Uh, the issue with the, I, I think is, you know, we have the drivers of malnutrition are, are unique to each context across our environment, economies, social and health system, that's first. And second, there is no one, no one size fits all blueprint for a nutrition sensitive or integrated uh, wash nutrition program. Uh, and then we have the third point is the dry land conditions, such as region experiencing water insecurity due to, to, due to climate and other vulnerabilities or further exacerbate poor wash water sanitation hygiene status as a driver of malnutrition. So analyzing these, the existing inequalities and power imbalances uh, from my view is really uh, fundamental to contextualize any program or policy recommendation for water sanitation hygiene, climate or water security, which then impact on the nutrition, especially in the dry land already facing vulnerabilities. Uh, and I think we, we have a lot to learn from uh, the men and women living in the dry land, because I think if we talk about resilience, these people have been the most resilience I have known in my, in, 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 in my experience. And I'm coming from, from this region and I, I have, I live there and I have worked there for years. So uh, I think it's really, there is a lot to, to learn from, from, from their own experiences. Next slide, please. So, and uh, this is really to, to show the conceptual links between the climate change and, and nutrition. And, and just, you know, I think that for those that have uh, uh, access to the Global Nutrition Report 2015, I, I will encourage you to go there and then you will find this conceptual uh, uh, um, uh, diagram. And, and where the poor, poor water sanitation hygiene comes in is really, you know, it's the, you know, the environment people are living in, the health, uh, and, 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 and how the environment can be either enabling or disabling and water, water security being really a key part of the enabling uh, uh, um, uh, environment uh, in which the, the, the men and the women from the dry land lives in because, and I will, uh, later you will see that there are specific examples on how improving the, the water security and improving uh, the, 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 the access to safe water 
uh, the adequate uh, uh, sanitation and hygiene, how it's also supporting the health of the people, how it's supporting their education, how it's also contributing to uh, better equality and inclusion. So it's just to so show, you know, that you can talk about you can talk about uh, the 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 context of the dry land. Uh, the, the livelihood of the men and the women that live there, uh, talking about the nutrition, you know, um, or, or the malnutrition, without really talking about their access to, to water sanitation and, and, and hygiene, and, and also how any solutions towards really addressing the, the issue they are facing to improve the, the nutrition via uh, sustainable and good livelihood really need to take into account uh, that, that access to water sanitation hygiene. Next slide, please. So um, now uh, let me talk about the, the, the resilience, you know, building the resilience and the water access to water sanitation hygiene and, and how it it's, can support the, the livelihoods, uh, the resilience and the green recovery. And for, for you know, you see in this circle and, and where we, we are talking about really the basic human needs of, of men and women and how the environment, the, 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 the energy, the agriculture industry really as you know, all of this about when we talk about water security, how all of these, these different spheres, uh, are, are the water security is connected to them. So the definition we at WaterAid give to, to the water security is having really reliable access to water of sufficient quantity and quality for basic human needs, for the small scale livelihood, for the ecosystem services, coupled with effective management of water related risk. So that's what this, this, this circle is trying to, to, sh uh, to um, uh, translate in, in you know, where you have the really putting at the center, the, the, the basic human needs of the men and the women. Next slide, please. So what are the threats to water security? You know, why water, se why, why water security uh, is, is, uh, it, it matters and, and, and what are the threats? So we need really to, for, for us to address them. Um, it's, you know, and, and what are the complex interactions? And again, uh, really, if you look at the political economy, I don't want to go into detail into that, but I think it's just, you, you just look at uh, the, the, the different connection you have uh, between the, 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 the social, uh, the gender and social inclusion, you look at the uh, empowerment of people and, and, and communities, you know, com I, I always want to talk about men and women because communities, I think the, 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 the word tend not to really look at the, the people in, in their specific uh, and status, uh, specific status and, and, and conditions. Uh, so, so that means you can't really, uh, Hazard and vulnerability vary from place to place. I, I mentioned that earlier. And in practice, we cannot single out clim, uh, climate change alone. So we, we have to really look at what are the multiple hazards and vulnerabilities that are really affecting the people and that are uh, undermining or uh, uh, making their resilience uh, a challenge and how, because we then how to address them, those in order to, to be building their resilience. Uh, next slide, please. So, Mariam, less than one minute, if you can wrap up. Yes. So, uh, very quickly, I just want to talk about the community-based water resource management in rural West Africa, where it's really supporting community to be able to identify uh, the water users and, and stress before service is introduced to be able to assess the quantity of the water available for the different users of the community through monitoring the water level and rainfall data. And the picture shows you how we do it. And then the third step being taking these data, data that have been collected to inform the design of water facilities for the multiple users of services uh, and, uh, services and appropriate management arrangement. Then when do we need to take the water, uh, to use the water for, uh, the market gardening of the women when the animals can come for, from the pastoralists and take the water. So to avoid, to really have a collective responsibility on really managing the, the, the water resources towards 
uh, helping uh, uh, making decisions on how to use it at what moment and for whom and and which which make really uh, strong the community in in the in and the leadership of the community of the community in 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 its it, in their ability really to 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 manage the different demand and 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 address them very quickly maybe on the other ones i i mean i'm going to wrap it i just want the uh, next slide please if i can go to um so uh, we we can skip this one because this is as i said agreeing the community making you know but just to say how this can be really linked to uh, malnutrition, uh, uh, you know, and how to improve that malnutrition. So we have a specific example in, in Talo uh, in Mali, which, it, uh, you know, working with a health uh, uh, district through the access to water sanitation hygiene and really getting really the people that, you know, uh, involved from the beginning to the end in, 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 in really identifying the issue sharing the information and and bringing up uh, or building up the knowledge about the linkages between water sanitation hygiene and nutrition uh, among the different stakeholders and then being able to get that to, to work on the synergy between the action between wash nutrition and health so rather than you know uh, getting different single sectors doing their own thing so and i we, uh, you know we can share that experience i just want to go to my final slide which i think is about what need to change as i don't have in, uh, a lot of time so i think if we look at really uh, um, at uh, um, you know building the resilience of the men and women living in dry lands towards really addressing the 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 acute malnutrition uh, you know i think it's really important to be linking the short term urgent response to nutrition, which we see when there is uh, uh, an emergency and we know this, 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 the dry land are really prone to, uh, to, to either environment, natural or uh, uh, human-made shocks. Uh, so it's really building that long-term systemic change in water security to resilience, to sustain positive outcomes. So the, the, the short term has to be linked to the longer term development approach. And then it's really the second one is the people of dry land, the men, women, boys and girls, the people with disability need to be put at the center of the plant and the policy. And what does it mean? Often we, we can say that and you know, a very nice statement, but here it's to say that it has to start with them by them identifying what are the challenges so we don't look at them as just the beneficiaries uh, of 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 you know the policies and the practices we want to change and the goodwill will we have but look at them as actors and not actors in in just one specific but across the process the third one is working together to drive the required changes in a in a given context so towards building a systematic multi-sectoral and multi-actors approach throughout the process uh, i know that there are very good examples of that uh, but we also are conscious that we need to improve uh, to to keep really improving how we do it and the fourth one which i will i'm going to end here is analyzing uh, uh, and contextualizing and addressing gender and power imbalances in policies, practices and behaviors and, and on a very systematic way. And again, by getting the people, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, as part of it. And, you know, so let me stop here and, and looking forward to uh, questions and, and comment from you on the, on the subject. Thank you and, and, and bye for now. Thank you very much, Mariam. And now let's hear from Tumbi. Hey, thanks and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, today I'll be speaking about the Livestock for Health study, which is a collaborative study between the institutions whose logos are on that slide. Um, and its main uh, aim is to test whether the intervention of uh, providing lights of feed during critical dry periods is a way of um, minimizing the risk of malnutrition among children and, uh, and, and women. Next slide. 
perhaps of Kenya um, representing the availability of um, foreign time on the transition from this that uh, the odds of uh, severe and extreme porridge uh, deficit, which are you know, presented by the intense red color, um, increasing. You can see them, there are a lot more happening towards the years, the last couple of years, and happening even for a longer period of time. Now, the important thing to notice is that these periods uh, coincide with the periods when you have acute malnutrition problems within these communities. Um, and the areas that are in these maps of Kenya here that have this uh, deficit of, uh, of forage, light of forage, are actually the northern uh, parts of Kenya, which are mainly occupied by the pastoralist communities. Next slide. So the pastoralist communities have adapted a way of life to deal with uh, these changing climatic conditions or climate variability. Um, which includes a main one is the livestock migration in search of pastures and water when, 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 when the conditions are not good for, for, for livestock. Now, the practice among these communities is once they let their animals go on migration, um, they will leave a few of them around the homestead with the idea that they can provide Uh, milk, at least sometimes nutrition because we have a lot of children. So Tundi, your your audio is breaking up. So what I'm going to no, study um Tumbi, what I'm going to suggest is that we go on to Mokdar. And then we can come back to you once we finish, we fix your audio issues. Mokhtar, can we go on to you? Yeah, yes, please. Thank you very much. If you can put up uh, the slide. Uh, hello, colleague. Hello, everybody. Uh, I would like to take you through what we are doing. Um, at Fowl site, in terms of uh, you know dry land, the forestry contribution to um, food security and nutrition. Next, next slide, please. Um, the context of the dry land, we we have really produced a lot of document on that. And if you can see the the, the logo, action against desertification. If you go on that. Uh, web pages you will see you know all the activity that we are uh, doing in the dry lands a uh, very important component in terms of uh, food production globally and in terms of livestock you come to you know africa you have seen in the introductory uh, slide the map of the the continent just in the south of the sahara that is where you have the whole great blue world program that we are working on uh, in terms of environment, uh, in terms of uh, <clears throat> the context for, for that part of the, the, the continent, uh, you have a three-month rainfall, and the, the rainfall really in that arid and semi-arid uh, range between 100 millimeter to maximum 600 millimeter. So in three months time, you have really farmers have to produce and to get everything from you know, the arable land. Uh, the livelihood and uh, you know so what what we built around this program is uh, the linkage between uh, livelihood seasonality and what can be produced uh, during that period and also how to bridge the the nine to eleven month of uh, you know the, the dry season next slide please that is roughly the context but if you look at the contribution of forest um Yes, I, I used to say you have a, uh, the hunter-gatherer, you know, the, the gathering was really from the forest uh, during millennia before even, you know, we develop uh, the agriculture and domestication of the species. That is really the massive context, but even today it's valid because uh, forest wild plant are still contributing to uh, dietary diversity, uh, the quality, the seasonality, 
And as you know, the other speakers have mentioned it, it's really still important um, for the community living there. Next, please. Now, this is just uh, um, some of the, the statistic and the information that have been worked on to, to show that if you know, um, the high exposure to the forest um, cause children to have a 25% greater dietary uh, diversity. This is really, really important. I've been analyzed and it show how the, the forest can contribute really to, to you know, the population uh, for the nutrition and the quality of uh, the, the, the diet. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, as I was introducing, what is our approach? Uh, just to remind you that uh, you know all what exists in the forest, um, the resilience of the community are really really important. That's how they manage to survive in that harsh environment for for millennia or for thousands of years. Um, the, the symbiotic relationship between the landscape, the livelihood, and nutrition are, are really really important. Now, what we do um, in terms of what exists as a forest resources is not uh, it doesn't stay forever. It's something that change, and that is really depleting. Globally, you have something like 400,000 vascular plant species that have been already studied. And among that, you, you, know, you have fewer than 200 species that are currently used. Even that is really a great diversity. But if you look at the agricultural side, it's come to some dozen of species that are mainly cultivated and so on. And most of these species, are, you find that in the, in the, in the dry land, either cultivated as a cereal or pulses, but also it exists in the wild that can be harvested. Now, our approach, next slide, please. Our approach is to, to, to look at that context and see how we can halt or mitigate or reduce the depletion of uh, uh, those resources in the dry land. Now we start with uh, identify what needs to be done on the ground. When do you need uh, to get those species and work with the communities uh, how to improve uh, their livelihood, their lifestyle. For those who knows that sort of environment in the dry land, livestock is important. Livestock and agriculture is really, really important. And um, you know how, how you, you, you can intervene and help to, to, to reduce the depletion of uh, uh, those uh, natural resources. The pictures I put that these are related to what sort of activity. Of, so if you look at, uh, at the edge of the Sahara, in the semi-arid and so on, those plants are disappearing year after year. So what we do, we have some intervention with uh, the communities. Here is uh, something like uh, 200 hectares, completely bare soil, where you cannot even have a natural regeneration. So we put in some machinery uh, to work on the ground uh, for the water harvesting, uh, because all the agriculture and the plantation are linked to uh, just the rain water during the, this three months. So you prepare the land in that way, it captured the water, and it's allowed you now to plant the seedlings that grow. You can see that uh, in the, the second picture at the bottom. So what need to be planted so uh, next slide please you go to the community and then you discuss uh, about uh, plant and people what the plants are used for it, uh, apart from the feed and uh, the food for people you have also uh, the the the, uh, the livelihood and uh, for for mainly the the, the at the community level I just want now to talk about uh, some of the most important critical species that really contribute uh, to the nutrition uh, of the nomad of people living in that area. One of them is Balanites uh, aegyptiaca. This is the scientific name. It's called the desert date. You have a lot of information about uh, you know, the content or the use of that, that species. Yeah, next slide, please. These are the species more sought out by the community that they plant. It exists in, in the wild, but as I said, it's de depleting. So they need to regenerate to domesticate those species. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the oil extracted in the, uh, from the, 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 the fruit. The fruits are pulpy and the sweet fruit. 
you can either edible. The composition of all there, it, it just provides what they call the healthy fat or the healthy oil. But what we do beside the planting of those species, uh, we have been training uh, the village community like these uh, ladies, how to use the oil to make some soap, which is quite critical at this time of, of COVID for hygiene uh, and hand washing and so on. These are some of the industry. So besides planting the species, besides using uh, the non timber forest product, the byproduct coming from the species, how also you can help them for their own use and also for you know, income generation in the village level. Next slide, please. The second species- I just... fire, You're now at time, if you could please wrap up. Yeah, okay. The second species are Bosia senegalensis. This is one of the species that remain green during the dry season and it's produced during the dry season. That's helped really to bridge the gap uh, before the raining season that uh, the farmers can cultivate and get uh, uh, something from the farm. Next slide, please. Sclerocaria birria, some of you may be uh, familiar with that is a marula also heavily used of some, you know, good fat, as, uh, fat content that, you know, is used to improve the nutrition uh, of the community living there. Uh, next slide, please. I'm rushing because I just gave you some of the, the few examples. Uh, this is one of the best examples that have been successful in what we're doing with the communities. Uh, I call it the, the two in one species. You have the feed and the, the food at the same time. As you remember, the lifestyle is help, you know, to, to uh, take care of the animals and also for, for the people. Three species, the annuals, the panicum, digitaria, and senna. Some are wild fonio for those who know the species in the area. So we plant them at the same time to improve the land productivity, the vegetation cover, the grain are used for, you know, as a food and also the animal use that for, for the feed. My last slide, um, just to wrap up because time is time running. Uh, these are some of the, the, the way forward that we are building, how to, to support the decision making. We have a lot of data that we're putting on the, on the website uh, and, and forward side that you can see. I will jump straight to my last point, really how to educate the consumers, the awareness. And what I put into bracket is just how to reduce the stigma. In every you know, uh, part of the planet, you know, the fact that things come from the village or come from the farmers is sometimes really overlooked and uh, not, not valued. But today to, to maintain the biodiversity, to maintain the food production, to maintain the diversity of you know, what comes from the wild, we have really to, to work to reduce the stigma and then to do more research, to give more information to, to people. With that, I mean, I, I will stop uh, here and thank you very much uh, for your attention. Over to thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mukhtar. Um, we're now going to go back to Thumbi and hopefully we've been able to resolve the audio issues. Thumbi, I'm going to ask you not to use your video and to start on your third slide with the trial design. Over to you. Right, so I was mentioning that the practice among these pastoralist communities is to leave a few milking animals around the homestead when the rest of the herd migrates. Um, and this allows for continued supply of milk to the family, particularly to children and women who are often left behind when migration takes place. In response to, you know, these drought seasons, uh, the emergency responses support these communities uh, through provision of livestock feed um, and also treatment of malnourished children. Now, our study um, is aiming to test whether the provision of these livestock feeds during these critical dry periods reduces the risk of malnutrition in children and mothers, and whether this arm that receives lights of feed, another that receives lights of feed and nutritional counseling, and a third arm that, has a, that is a comparator arm, which you call a control arm. All the arms, including the control arm, receive dewormers as a good way of uh, providing an incentive and benefit for the participants. In total, we are following 800 households, 1800 households, uh, each household has a child at least uh, below five years and a mother. 
Um, and each household is visited every six weeks uh, and we collect data on new production, data intakes and other thematic measures to have a good measure of digital status in addition to other socioeconomic data. Next slide. So the way that we provide livestock feed is each family provides at least two tropical livestock units, which is equivalent to either two cows or two cows, a combination of animals as shown on that slide. And we provide sufficient feed to last them for 90 days, which is the dry period when we want to observe whether this has an effect. On the next slide, um, before rolling out the intervention trial, uh, we used participatory epidemiology methods to obtain community perspectives regarding uh, the livelihood strategies that these communities employ and factors that are associated with malnutrition in children and also in women and their perspectives on how to um, reduce uh, malnutrition. Now from that work on the next slide, we have an, a, a report on seasonality of malnutrition that captures these community perspectives. Um, and the main take home message really is that animal source foods play a critical role in the nutrition of these communities. And that the observed uh, peaks of undernutrition um, are synchronized with dry seasons and, and, and important underlying factors include uh, economic status of households, social issues and, and humanities. On the next slide, we obtained information regarding the drivers of malnutrition in children. Um, and these are related mainly, the family drivers related mainly to climate, socioeconomic issues that include poverty, um, broken families that really limit uh, social support, and, and even cultural norms that lead to like early, early weaning and poor health, which are all associated with, with malnutrition. And the net effect of this is and the intermediate drivers is a poor access to nutritious foods and, 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 and observed malnutrition in children. When we asked them uh, regarding, um, you know, the, on the next slide, mothers, the primary drivers of malnutrition are four mothers, um, is in addition to the ones I have mentioned for children, is the low education levels and limited access to health facilities all seem to really play a big role to, to this increased risk of malnutrition in children. Now, I mean, in women. Now, this data on community perspectives are key if, and have to really take into account uh, of them when we are addressing malnutrition challenges in this, in this environment. Now, next slide, back to the longitudinal study that I've just talked about. Um, we have a year's data of livestock migration. Um, and here we are showing the proportion of herds uh, by grazing distances from their homestead. Now, the dark green at the very top shows the proportion of households that are reporting their herds to have migrated. And you can see uh, towards last year, we had up to 50% of the herds been away from the homestead. Um, and, and, and in 2020, we have had good rains and um, you know, the number of animals that are, are, are grazing beyond 10 kilometers are fewer. Now, on the next slide, um, I showed data on milk production. Now, if you remember the previous slide, you were showing there was high migration here, and you can see the average milk production is actually quite down towards the, um, the mid part, the, the, last, the last quarter of, um, of, of, 20, of, of last year, and that increased as the rains came in. Now, the occasional spikes in, um, in milk production that you can see here are associated with brief periods when animals come back for cultural festivities within the villages. Now on the next slide, I show some data as well in, in, in different milk consumption and also malnutrition among women and children. Um, so here, what you see on the left is milk consumption for children and what you see on the right here is milk consumption uh, for women. Um, and you can see this a bit more consistency among children compared to, to the women showing clearly that there is a prioritization of children to receive milk whenever they, have, they, have, they don't have enough. On the next slide, um, we show one year data on the proportion of studied children uh, with severe and moderate uh, acute malnutrition uh, shown here by these two colors at the top. And what you can see is obviously that this appears to be changing over time. And on the right here is um, you know, proportion of women who are at risk of malnutrition and those that are normal. Now, ultimately, what we want is to link this data on nutritional status of children and mothers with the data that I've shown you previously on household milk production and food consumption measured during the follow-up uh, studies. Uh, on my last slide, um, from our work, um, we 
we, we recognize really important things. One is that the pastoralist livelihoods are strongly linked to their, to their livestock. Um, and the prolonged dry periods uh, seem to limit access to milk and are associated with seasonal spikes in malnutrition. Um, what we learn is that interventions that seek to address these seasonal spikes uh, should actually build upon these local coping mechanisms, like, like the one I've mentioned about leaving a few animals around uh, during migration to, to, to allow for sustained milk production. Now, by the end of, of this study, we should know if provision of livestock feed uh, is a cost-effective and scalable approach uh, to preventing seasonal spikes in malnutrition. Uh, many thanks for listening. Thank you, Thumbi. I'm glad we were able to, to resolve our, our audio problems and, and hear your presentation. Now on to our final panelist, Helen. Thank you, Christine. <clears throat> Today, I will be talking about dryland livelihood systems and nutrition. First, I would like to look back at the original malnutrition causality framework to consider what role livelihoods might have played. And shown here on the right is an, ex an extract of the basic causes from that uh, original framework. And um, uh, the, the net nutrition strategy, the narrative that accompanies that framework, emphasized production systems and systems thinking, as shown in that quote there that's drawn from that strategy. This interest coincided with a wider development policy shift towards sustainable livelihoods that I'm sure you're all familiar with. However, within the field of nutrition, this interest was soon to be overtaken by a rapid expansion of emergency nutrition from the 90s onwards, which was followed in the past decade by a well-defined, more action-oriented focus on the immediate and underlying causes and the essential actions that we, we know well today. Now, a key aspect of the original framework that I want to emphasize is the role of formal and informal institutions. However, two years after this was published in 1992, um, that edition of the framework, um, institutions were removed. And to my knowledge, they've not reappeared since. Um, but as we learned from our webinar last week, systems and institutions remain crucially important to livelihoods and nutrition. Next slide, please. So moving on to consider the unique characteristics of livelihood systems that are adapted to Africa's drylands. Obviously, there is a long history of livelihood adaptation to variability, as we heard from our first webinar um, speakers. And I just want to emphasize that much can be learned from pastoralists and other dryland producers whose specialist livelihood strategies enable them to take advantage of the environmental variability of drylands in order to improve their production. In other words, they work with variability rather than against it, and they have relatively low inputs and make a limited impact on the environment. Next slide, please. This long-term process of successful adaptation is the reason why specialist livelihood systems are fundamentally resilient. Their specialist skills and experience in responding to variability and managing dryland resources are adapted to what outsiders might consider to be the harsh conditions associated with drylands. So moving on to think, talk about uh, vulnerability, which I framed as livelihood, oh, sorry, if we can go back to the last slide. Thank you. Livelihood precarity and persistent acute malnutrition. We're all aware that worsening conditions linked to persistent climate shocks, protracted conflict, sudden economic downturns, combined or in combination with poor governance or weak or failing institutions, have undermined these adapted livelihood systems, their resilience, and increased the precarity of livelihoods. And I pulled out a few examples that I think are pretty common, like the privatization of the commons and the practices that are linked to resource extraction. We heard about the inequalities that are exacerbated in times of crisis. For example, in times of crisis, we often see coping strategies which increase the risk and vulnerability of women in particular. Insecurity and conflict is frequently a problem at multiple levels and of increasing complexity, whether this is localized farmer herder conflict or civil conflict between armed forces. 
And I also wanted to mention COVID-19 that has particular implications for local livelihoods. As we all know, the poor cannot afford to limit their social interaction and must work in order to feed themselves. If we want to understand how livelihoods impact in nu nutrition, we first need to understand how livelihood systems work. Next slide, please. Over the past two decades, we've learned much from livelihoods analysis. And one of the things we've learned is that we need to look beyond what people do for a living, what they produce, what they earn, and instead look deeper into what they require to do this. Now, livelihood resources are a big part of the answer to that question. And for farming, this means access to farmland, pastoralism, it might be seasonal pastures, forest products, water, but they also need relevant skills, experience, and a range of other resources. But often when we ask producers these questions, they very quickly look beyond the resource itself to talk about their relationship to it and how this is managed. For example, through fairer land tenure regimes, access to financial services, open migratory routes for animals, water resources in the dry season, access to land for women, and the list goes on and on. And also increasingly in conflict settings, people will prioritize security and protection as essential for their livelihood. Now, all of these things fall under the domain of formal and informal institutions. So if we want to understand how livelihood systems work and their resilience and their impact on nutrition, we really need to think about institutions. Next slide, please. And anyway, to sum up, uh, what people do depends on their access to resources, which in turn are mediated or governed by institutions. Addressing the basic drivers of malnutrition calls for a more systemic approach, strengthening these same livelihood systems and their institutions, which uphold nutrition and address the underlying drivers of malnutrition. So this approach is less about what to do, the intervention that addresses the underlying causes, and more about the process of systemic and institutional change, and a focus on livelihoods that reflects locally led priorities. Finally, with my last slide, I want to share some reflections on research and learning on livelihoods, which I think are very relevant to addressing malnutrition. And I have three main points. Next slide, please. And, and thank you. So first of all, an emphasis on locally led learning, which means proactively working with stakeholders and their institutions. And I really want to mention here the, the importance of empowering and capacity building local researchers and their institutions based on the latest evidence and understanding. And the importance of identifying research gaps, which would lead to a more demand led research and learning process, not one driven by fashion. Finally, under locally led learning, uh, I think we need to consider something we heard last week. Um, I framed it in terms of grasping the nettle, which means kind of putting ourselves outside of our comfort zone. And we have to do that if we're going to extend our own learning and embrace new ideas or approaches. Last week, for example, we, were, we heard that we must consider power as well as vulnerability. And I think those raise difficult questions for a lot of us. Moving on, we often talk about best mixed methods, and I really want to emphasize we must use the best tools for the job and tailor the methods to the research questions and not the other way around. And this means looking beyond the standard qualitative and quantitative approaches to explore more participatory and innovative approaches. And we heard a lot of examples of those, again, in our earlier webinars. Um, I also stress historical perspectives and the need to pay more attention to long-term trends and seasonality in our, in, our, in our methods. And finally, a comment on the role for RCTs, randomized controlled trials, often thought of, as, and rightly so, as the gold standard. They are obviously important, but I would argue only at the end of the learning process to validate approaches that have been designed on the basis of formative research and learning. Finally, I want to emphasize the role for research uptake 
as part of a process of systemic and institutional change, which might include participation and consultation from, from the very start of the learning process, capacity building that is two-way and recognizes the strengths, resources, skills, and experience of all actors and builds capacities and collaboration based on this. And finally, I think we need to build a shared commitment to addressing acute malnutrition by first ensuring a shared understanding, which requires a locally adapted conceptual framework that stakeholders can relate to and contribute to. Thank you. Over to you, Christine. Thank you, Helen. This concludes the prepared topics we had for discussion. Miriam has reminded us that a combination of context specific factors drive acute malnutrition in Africa's drylands. We must understand these factors and contexts from the perspective of the people who live them. Community based approaches and valuing the voice of all community members is of greatest importance. We must integrate these perspectives with data and evidence-based approaches to cross-sectoral water sanita san sanitation and hygiene assistance with nutrition, resilience, and security. We must also remember that those with the least decision-making power and input bear the highest burden in terms of the impacts of shocks and negative externalities. Equality and inclusion are of the highest relevance to building climate, environment, and water resilience. Thumbi reminded us that drought cycles are getting shorter and droughts themselves appear to be increasing in severity in the Horn of Africa. He introduced us to research on the impacts of integrating livestock and nutrition interventions for improving dry season nutrition. The study has demonstrated the importance of animal source foods to pastoralist nutrition. The study has also shown that access to animal source foods is limited during dry seasons and droughts, and that seasonal spikes in malnutrition are associated with decreased milk availability. Nutrition interventions need to be linked with local coping strategies, with a focus on milk and other animal source foods in pastoral areas. Mokhtar discussed the importance of smallholder dryland producers to the world's overall crop and livestock production. Forest, trees, and wild foods are particularly important to seasonal dietary quality and diversity. Diversification of production is the key. Fewer than 200 species make substantial contributions to global food output, suggesting a decline in diversity in production systems and diets. Diversity is also important in rangelands, which must be managed with a landscape approach. Environmental, economic, and social needs must be met to achieve economically and nutritionally resilient livelihoods in Africa's drylands. Finally, Helen reminded us about the focus on production, livelihoods, institutions, and systems thinking in the original malnutrition causality framework from the 1990s. Livelihoods in Africa's drylands are intrinsically adapted to the variability that their environments present. This adaptation has taken place over decades, if not centuries, and demonstrates why specialist livelihood systems are fundamentally resilient. Persistent shocks and negative externalities have been undermining this resilience. Therefore, successfully addressing acute malnutrition in Africa's drylands will require going back to the basics on how these livelihood systems work, taking community-led approaches, and working to create institutional environments that support resilience. With the remaining time, I'd like to open things up more generally to the audience. I'm going to turn it over to Greg to manage the question and answer. I know he's busily been collecting the questions that you've been sending through. Uh, thanks, Christine. Before we go to the Q&A, I would like to quickly mention some ways that you can get involved and learn more about uh, the event when we are finished here today. We have a website shown here dedicated to this technical series and follow-up work. On this website, you'll find short videos about the series, details about each event, 
So you can register if the event has already happened, you'll find the recordings. You can review the adapted framework and get more information about each of the three interlinked areas of basic drivers. You can find resources and you can do a number of things to get involved. Join the email list or submit questions for panelists. This is for past or upcoming panels. So if a burning question comes to you after the event, please send it to us. You can also submit feedback or tell us about your experiences addressing basic causes of malnutrition. And finally, you can tell us what you think of these events. We hope you will engage with us through this platform. Now, on to the questions. Please continue to add your questions in French or English as you have them. We will get to as many as we can, but I can't make any promises since we have many people on the event. I'd like to start with a question that we got in the question and answer during one of the previous panels. I have a few of them that we held aside because they were particularly relevant to this panel. I'll start with one of them for now, and this is for Miriam. Poor water access is a major contributor to malnutrition in the rangelands. Do we have sustainable methods of ensuring there is adequate water access to these areas? Because water trucking and related methods are not sustainable. Mm. Thank you so much. This is really a very relevant question. And I was, um, uh, uh, I talked about one of the um, um, approaches we have used at WaterAid, which is the community-based water resource management. And I think there are so many met methods and technologies from the rainwater harvest harvesting to the sun dams uh, 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 technology that we can really capture but, and, and use for to really address that issue of access to water. And I think linking it to uh, what um, um, uh, Ellen was talking about in terms of really trying to also as actors to learn more about the existing uh, methods and, and approaches and technology that the communities themselves have, have been using over the year. I think also Tumbi mentioned that we're talking about. So it's really how we can build that, but there are plenty of methods that, and I'm just taking this, you know, the water resource management through using the community uh, technology through the uh, rainwater harvesting or the, or the sun dams. Which, which has been working uh, as far as our experience is concerned. Thank you. Good, uh, thank you, Miriam. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question here, if I may. Um, this is for Helen or for Chris. From a program and policy point of view, how do we shift the focus to the basic drivers and bring about change? Helen or Chris? Uh, yes, this is Go Helen. Yep. Um, uh, this is a question I have, I've also been asking myself and I'm, um, I should share with you a recent experience. We had a, an exercise recently where we wanted, we worked with a large group of people in Kenya to identify basic causes. And these were people from the Asal counties. And we, we explicitly asked them to um, yeah, identify and go into more detail on basic causes. And what was very impressive was that they articulated very clearly some of the issues that we're familiar with, but they saw how that they linked in causal pathways to malnutrition. So I, uh, f from my perspective, we simply have to look at these more deeply, whereas many of the analyses we do focus in on the specific underlying causes without actually drawing attention to the basic causes. Good, thank you, Helen. Uh, Chris, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, just, I think Helen's absolutely right. I would add that um, there is quite, during emergencies, there's quite a focus on emergency nutrition interventions when that's appropriate, but it's so important to, to focus on these issues um, during the recovery period and during that critical period between emergencies where we should be moving from um, humanitarian assistance to um, the more development nexus. Um, so the important work needs to be done to, to help us all 
move towards these these more institutionalized approaches. Good, thank you, Chris. Uh, I have a question for uh, for Mukhtar, I believe. Uh, Mukhtar, are you ready? How do we move the non-forest foods produced by communities from being niche and expensive foods to the mainstream food markets? Also, how do we educate non-rural communities on the benefits of such foods? Wow, that, that is a you know, very relevant and very important question. I mean, again, we, we really need um, to focus on you know, education and getting uh, you know, more research on what exists really as uh, the wild food or the, the uh, food coming from the, 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 the forest. Because as I said in my slide at the end that uh, you know, we need first to remove the stigma. Because of the agricultural habit, what we have, the uh, wheat, potatoes, uh, what people are used to, I mean, they, they can only see that. Once you have the equivalent of the same uh, type of species or the nutritious value in the wild, but which is not known. Now, it, it really, we're trying to, to link up how the, the, the variety and the diversity of this food can, you know, be bring into a plate like uh, the orange, like the banana, at the same level as uh, you know the the what people are used to. Um, yeah, it it will require really some institutional changes, and we are tackling that bit by bit. You you need to do a lot of work, even with the the farmers and the communities, for themselves to believe that you know it, it's a good product, is good for them, and it's good for every, everybody else. So yeah, I mean, the, the discussion is going on because the more and more, as I said, the, the bridge between what is cultivated or what is domesticated in terms of agriculture need to be completed with what come from the forest. And they have really same value and even sometimes better. I talk about the Balanitas oil. These are edible oils. It can help to do a lot of stuff, just like uh, the argan in, in Morocco who are really now, uh, you know, well used in the, in the market species like uh, she better that that has evolved there's really a number of species that is coming now in the mainstream but it really need a, a, a lot of work a lot of research and the, the involvement of uh, different institutions over to you chris uh, thank you mokhtar thank you uh tumbi i have a question for you why is it important to integrate research partners local government and non-government actors and the communities in addressing the observed persistent spikes in undernutrition among pastoralist communities? Thank you, that, that's a good question. Um, I think the first thing to understand is that really not one sector has the monopoly of knowledge and that there is obviously a lot that you can learn from the communities. Uh, there's a lot that you know, governments are making their own decisions as to how they respond to the needs of the people. And I see it really critical that when you're addressing some of these, uh, as we say, messy problems, uh, they will require a lot of disciplines to come together, but also a lot of sectors to come together. In our case, for instance, we have had responses in Northern Kenya that you know, provide livestock feed and, and water during uh, critical dry periods. Um, but we, 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 we don't have good data to tell us whether is that a cost effective way of dealing with the problem of malnutrition. And engaging in this kind of uh, work where you have a research partner, you've got um, you know, the authorities that, that provide this kind of emergency responses like the National Drought Management Agency and partners at national and international level is really critical to have a holistic um, response that is also acceptable really by the community. So I do think it's really critical not to have this as a single sector or single um, uh, you know, department uh, response, but it's, 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 it should bring in more, more sectors and more people together. Um, good, thank you, Tumbi. Um, here's a question that I think will go to you, Helen. Um, the RCT in Kenya is an eye-opener and motivation to move past the usual research methods. During an RCT, how do you control for many factors, confounders, 
that influence nutrition outcomes other than those that the researcher is interested in. Thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, very important question, but and I think part of the answer is in the presentation, um, particularly the use of um, formative research, um, in this case, participatory, participatory epidemiology epidemiology approaches in order to better understand what some of those confounders be and will be and then incorporating those into the design of your RCT so you can look at them directly. Um, I'm not a statistician, but I think th it, this does require partnerships between qualitative researchers and yeah, statisticians in order to get this right, um, but crucially important. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, I have a question that could go to several of you. So uh, take a listen and jump in if you think you need to. Uh, dry land areas and particularly Sahelian countries such as Burkina, Faso, Mali and Niger are not only facing challenges on accessing water in quantity and quality for their basic human needs, but they are facing insecurity due to terrorist attacks leading to massive population displacements. Could you share any experience in addressing malnutrition for IDPs? So this could be for Helen or this could be for Miriam. Um, who would like to jump in on that? Uh, if, I, if I may, uh, Chris, because uh, we, in the framework of uh, the Great Green Wall, we have been working, uh, you know, in those area, mainly the trans border between uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. Uh, what is happening now? It, it's uh, as I show in the picture, all the land that we are trying to uh, restore. That is what is now used by the displaced people uh, for, you know, the, the agricultural period. So. They farm in those land that have been prepared by, you know, the, the mechanized plows and uh, to, to, to bridge really the raining season. It was not planned for that, but our experience is that because they're moving a bit uh, south in the safer area, it's happened that we have been working uh, in those areas before the insecurity worsened. And they have been using now th those areas for, for, you know, the, the crop production during the, the raining season. That is the, the quick answer. But of course, I mean, we're trying to find a, a long-term solution as some of these people, it's not sometimes the whole village that are displaced, but some of those people still remain, um, you know, despite their security in, in their villages and they will really need more, more support. That's what I can say on this question. Over. Good, thank you, Mokar. Anybody else want to, um, want to join in on that? Yeah, maybe I should chip in, uh, mm -hmm. Greg. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to say that, um, the, the fact that these people are IDPs and they're in an area or region that's affected by conflict, automatically there are huge constraints and challenges to their livelihoods. So I think the first, the first question for me would be, what, uh, as a result, what are their coping strategies? How are they living? What are the risks and, and threats that they are facing? And I think in this context, we're clearly talking about a population that has humanitarian needs. And um, so, which is very, very different to when we're looking at more stable contexts. So yeah, I think that's worth recognizing. Thank you, Helen. Uh, anybody else with a comment on that? Yes, I just want to um, add to what uh, Ellen, and I think Mokhtar, I'm, I'm not sure, said. First of all, I think for addressing this, you know, the, 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 the long-term uh, solution will come from really addressing the underlying causes. Of, of the conflict that make making these people really leaving their 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 land to uh, being displaced. Now, in, for the inter, internal displaced displaced people, I think they deserve, you know, being taken care of uh, in in the humanitarian response. But even in in I think it's also getting sec uh, the other actors that were working in development in the area where these people have been dispersed to integrate them 
Uh, and that's one of the, you know, working either getting, ensuring that they have access to water, they have access to uh, adequate sanitation, and then having uh, also uh, uh, a program around hygiene, because that can also affect them, which, uh, which we have been doing at WaterAid is because often people think there is a division of those that are in the humanitarian space and those that are in the development space. And I think that the things change uh, and both the, having the humanitarian resp response, but also getting the development actors to be really integrating uh, the, the needs of these people in, in the work they have been doing, which is not easy because sometimes also it's, we often are working on, on a project are done and led, um, unfortunately. And, but I think we, see, we need a shift of mind. And here, the issue, the, prob the, 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 the issue that Ellen raised around about institutions and systems is really relevant. You know what the local institutions are also doing to uh, to ensure that uh, the needs of these IDPs are, are are addressed is absolutely critical. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Very good. Thank you all all to you for weighing in on that. I've got another question that I think will engage most of you, and here it is: from the four presentations, it is evident that intersectoral integration is key to addressing malnutrition. How can integration be effectively achieved in the arid context, especially in contexts where donor slash government funded projects are to a large extent siloed? That's sort of the $64,000 question. So Helen or anybody want to start on that? I think each one of you can have something to say on that. Thank you. Uh, this is Helen. Um, how can integration be achieved? Um, well, actually, I think this comes back to something Mokhtar said about not all, um, no single sector has a monopoly on knowledge. Um, uh, my answer would be, though, that we have to demonstrate what a more interdisciplinary approach might look like. And that spoke to my point about grasping the nettle. We, ha we have to w move out of our own sectors or are out, of a, out of our disciplines and engage with others and show the benefits of that um, and demonstrate the, the, the added value of interdisciplinary, multi-sectoral ways of working. Thank you. I may come in here. I think this is a must. It's really a must to have the integration. And 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 if if we want really to deliver the, the 2030 agenda and even to respond to really the the right uh, and, and the need of the people. And, and 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 but yes, it's a huge challenge. And I think the way of addressing it is first of all, uh, uh, it's really recognizing and 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 that. It's not just one aspect. You, some a lady years back was telling me, you know, when you 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 uh, a development actor, when you come to us, you know, you come and say, I, I deal with microfinance. Someone else come and said, I deal with health. But we are one person, families. We we need all of these. I think it's recognizing that we we need. It's about the lives of the people, and the lives of the people. They need all of these sectors to be joined up to address their needs. And then I think second is really understanding better and putting our foot, uh, our feet, sorry, in the shoes of the, the colleagues in the, uh, in the other sectors and having the willing, the, the will and, and, and humility to really you know, learn and use the strengths from the other sector and get together and get out of the projectizing. I, I think that's the biggest challenge and that's where governance and leadership in our countries matters. And that's where I think the, the actors and the communities, men and people, the citizens need really to come in also there to challenge our government on the way that they sectorize development and you know get more connection. But I think we can also model from the scale where we are, we can model how to do it. And it's happening at a, you know, in, 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 in quite few areas, but there is still a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Anybody else want to? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yes, please. Uh, I, I will just jump in to, to con I totally agree um, with, with my colleagues on that. Um, yes, what is really important, I mean, it sometimes is often, you know, easily said than really applied. That, that is the problem. It, it from both sides. 
the, the facilitator side, government side, the donor side as well. Because often you'll see, for example, some of the donor, they just came, they want a quick result. And being in the developing world, that's, you know, easily is accepted by the government and it creates more and more silo. So if you look at uh, what is needed on the ground, it's a full integration. I welcome this series of uh, you know, technical discussion that we have already started the integration. And you can see, I mean, not only from this series, the four presentation, but even for the previous presentations, I think before ending that we will start coming really with uh, something that is common that can help to address uh, the issues in the developing world with the communities and then to have some impact. And sometimes often really have effort and energy spent on some of these projects. I agree with Mariam, you know, projectizing is, is not good. This should be a program to tackle. We just mentioned in the previous discussion, the question related to, to displacement of people, the, the, the insecurity. If you look at the root cause of that, it's just because these communities have been neglected sometimes for years, no sign of development at all. That creates a lot of you know, havoc and all of a sudden it's just like, okay, we have to have humanitarian help, how to, you know, to, to, to address the resilient component and so on and so forth. So yes, integration is needed, uh, coordination to work together so that really we have some impact and then we have uh, you know, what needs to be put on the ground uh, to support the communities. But I really welcome all these series, I think we want to end it without really having some solid program that integrate different disciplines. Over. Thank you, Mokhtar. Um, um, go ahead, Tumbi. Yeah, I, mean, I think I really want to add that for integration, what, what's really critical is showing added value of bringing different disciplines together. I mean, I think in the absence of that, um, you know, cross-sectoral work is hard work because you're moving out of your comfort zone. So I think there ought to be deliberate efforts to identify what is the added benefit and be able to demonstrate that because then people can make investments in that. I think the other really thing, the thing that helps is if you've got like governments or, or, or donors making or insisting that there needs to be more sectoral approaches to the programs that they want to support, I think that forces different disciplines to work together. I think that's my contribution for that. Good, thank you, Tumbi. Uh, we've got time for at least another question. So um, this might be for Helen to start with. Apart from traditional coping mechanisms, what interventions have been found to work to improve nutrition in drylands? For example, SBCC, nutrition knowledge, or addressing cultural practices that affect intra-household food allocations. Let me start with you, Helen. Helen? Oh, excuse me. Yeah. You're muted, Helen. You're, you're muted, Helen. Yeah, okay. go ahead, jump in. Sorry, I must be clicking too many times. <laughs> um, yeah. I, was, I was saying that uh, the evidence base on the efficacy of nutrition sensitive interventions is generally weak. And this is very disappointing because we all put our faith in these interventions and we believe that they impact on nutrition. But the, um, often they, they, they're, when we do the RCTs, they're not showing the results. And I think this is for a, a, for a wide range of factors um, and, and reasons. Um, and it's, it might be partly down to the tools that we're using and the approaches that we use to assist the, to do this, but it also could be down to the, the design of the interventions. But I also wanted to make the, the, the point that in some of the dry land contexts where we've been working, we see these very extreme seasonal patterns. And that means not only that there are peaks in malnutrition, but that there are times of the year when the prevalence of malnutrition is very low. And I think we should, that this, this shows us that it's possible to bring down those rates um, given the local circumstances. And I think we need to focus on this and look at how we can make sure that these we stick with these lower rates and that they don't seasonally rise. So how do we prevent those seasonal peaks? 
Good, thanks, Helen. Um, okay, we are five minutes before the hour. So while we have a number of questions still in the chat, we are going to have to stop here to end things on time. Many of them are related to how these drivers affect our response. This is what we'll talk about next week. So I encourage you to register for that event and tune in. Keep an eye on your email. We will share the recording next in, within the next couple of days. And we will follow up after the high level donor roundtable to share the outcomes of that meeting. I will now ask Christine to give us some final thoughts. Christine, over to you. Thank you, Greg. I'd like to thank everyone for the rich discussion. Some of the things that came out for me in the question and answer uh, session was that in areas like the Sudan of Sahel, where insecurity is a prominent problem, there's a need to integrate humanitarian and development responses. And it's important to think about institutionalizing the malnutrition causality framework throughout the disaster cycle, particularly during recovery and disaster risk reduction. And it's important to think of intersectoral approaches to addressing malnutrition. We need to leave our siloed comfort zones and begin taking these holistic approaches. During today's webinar and throughout this technical series on the conceptual framework for addressing acute malnutrition in Africa's drylands, we've learned about the importance of shifting the focus from immediate and underlying drivers to the basic drivers. These basic drivers are the variable environment and its seasonality that dryland inhabitants live in and manage, the institutions that govern these systems, and the livelihood resources, goals, and strategies that residents of drylands employ to survive and thrive. Shifting the focus to these basic drivers should help to bring about change in the persistent malnutrition associated with Africa's drylands. This shift can be achieved through broad agreement on the basic drivers in the conceptual framework as a result of a consultation process that we all engage in today, engaging in learning that is locally led and demand driven by institutions of government and assistance in partnership with traditional institutions and mindful of informal institutions and their influence on nutrition. Prioritizing participation that values the voice of all community members engaging in partnerships that acknowledge and adjusting power imbalances, and embracing interdisciplinary and mixed method approaches that promote collaboration and shared understanding. Thank you everyone for your participation. This concludes our webinar for today. Please join us next week for the final panel in the series in which we will discuss how the basic drivers of acute malnutrition can and should shape the international response. Thank you and goodbye.